Development Committee meeting. I am Tom Wellington. Pete Peterson. Can you please speak? Dave Whitfield, planning. Drew Malone, planning for Strike for Ken. Uh, Sean Adele, planning. Andy Honest, Perks Office. And Forrest Dunbar. Amy Stonemeyer. Thank you. Um, so, Rich, we will probably be, um, <coughs> you should take probably 45 minutes or more before we can get to this mouth thing. If you can certainly work with the stack. Sure. If you have some stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so first up is Brown Bear Lab. You guys are welcome to sit up. Here. Brown Bear Labs, this is their manufacturing license. Um, it's the third license for our scheme. There's no overlapping of the license premises shown on the diagram. Um, although it's no licensing requirements for addressing the operating plan. Um, no Texas fees are fine to found due. And all of the manufacturing license requirements have been addressed as well. There is no recommended extra conditions to be added. Okay, uh, I was just, Chris Schutte came in and Kate did. Carrie, 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 yeah, that's right. Can you, oh, Mandy, can you send Chris your, um, um, did you email her? I emailed, or I texted her, I don't have his cell. It's, um, seven, it's three, four, three, seven, nine, two, nine. Three, four, three, seven. Yeah, I'm filling in for Randy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Basically, we can keep that in there, but it's, it's already been met, so it'll just get approved and we'll sign off on it. Any comments? Uh, the, so the parking, there's a parking on uh, page 36 that shows the parking plan. Is that, is that what's approved? That's what they submitted. Um, I think they 
just stepped up to do that. Okay. Yes, if you like to use. Yes, they were submitted to Building Safety Traffic Engineering Review and approved on December 1st, 2017, and my planning step for the property is going to be tracking on nine spaces. And that's this one on page 36, correct? So it seems to be the issue is that um, the landlord uses one unit and says this would block access to her unit. And I couldn't tell from this picture. Uh, where's the door to her unit? Or? Her contention is that she doesn't need parking spaces for her unit because it's a storage unit and she doesn't want parking spaces in front of her unit. And of course, put a connex in front of her unit. Really, that's her issue to do between her and the municipality. You provide her a parking plan that satisfies all of the uses and space for the building. Um, and if she wants to move forward to drop a comment on her space, that's her prerogative. Do, do you have how many how many spaces do you need for your six? You need six. So you would we would take the ones <coughs> further west near the snow storage area and then on the other side of the handicap one, and the other three would be first. Is, is that snow storage area um, available for parking when it's not covered with snow? I'm sure it is. Is, is that, Sean, is that? Uh, I think they have to be dedicated uh, uh, snow storage. Um, that's the other one. I'm going to have to look at the code on that real quick. Because last part of that, you can stripe it for parking. And There's it's some of them not snow on it as well. And, you know, when, not being used there in the winter it's being used for snow storage. Because that would be two more spots, practically speaking, <coughs> for most of them. Yes, in the, the snow storage area, I believe we're required to have 200 and some odd square feet in the square footage of the parking area, so our current snow storage area is large. Um, so we can condense it another 200 square feet and accommodate two more spaces in there if needed. <coughs> or you could shrink what's shown here. Right. You could know, also all storage. No, outside. And it looks like they may be looking into a shared parking addition as well. It's a neighbor's property. Yeah. It, what's the status on that? Um, that we're not yeah, looking into that. Um, after speaking with you know, Ian and Ryan and Dave, um, we satisfied all our requirements for the special ones, permit in my space, this will be traffic engineering. Um, yeah, no, Eli is correct. We had some discussions about this in the parking issue. And just a clarification, this parking plan was approved to the Black Bay Ridge prices for the C's application. And this site, as I understand it, may be correct in the end of this statement. I was going to have three marijuana license uses. There's uh, Black Bay Ridge prices. Is that the quotation? Correct. And the last thing needs. Is that the manufacturing retail hotel? And then it's Brown Bears Manufacturing. So the previous two already approved resolution approved by the assembly with this parking plan, the same one. And that's what he's speaking to. He says it's already approved. And this is a third application, same site, same parking area, same plan. Except now the owner of the property is described as withdrawal approval for um, their authorization to act. And our concern is well, you need the property owner's approval for an application to afford one. They've already submitted the application. So I'm going to hesitate to say that they can still go forward when you haven't processed this application as they have through the whole application process. And I'm fine, I think, with condition seven, they can. So whatever ultimately happens at the end, <coughs> this parking plan that you've submitted goes through. Then we'll offer any questions to the beneficiaries of the easement. But if then the owner of this the is parking plan is closed and it's not processed, you can write the same. You have to put parking plan on the um, outside of the judge building to you. If that's the case, then you have these two power applications that have the plan that's in conflict with a different plan that you ran through that I'm sure you're working on it. I think then that um, these two will be the ones that have my application. When you sign, you continue to have the same working and you sign as well as the applications have to run. So um, that's the issue we're going to have. Um, Dave, I think, might have something to say about that. I think it's a new issue that we need to talk about. So 
then the system will collect. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just clarify that the letter from the landlord's attorney said they weren't withdrawing permission to use the property for marijuana. They were withdrawing permission to, at that date, act as uh, the landlord's representation, which was what they gave uh, Eli and Raquel to do. Um, and so, you know, just a little bit of history here. Eli has pointed out to the landlord, like, hey, you haven't really maintained this building, and there's a couple things I need you to fix. Um, there's a leak in the roof, and things that cost money. And then in response, we got this revocation of your right, the right to act on the, her behalf. So there's a little bit of a civil issue here that we just request that we get to handle civilly. We not, it's not an open use problem. Any thoughts? Yeah, I have that there is no intention of entering into a shared parking agreement with a neighbor. Everything's going to remain the same. And from our point of view, the landlord doesn't like the parking plan, the owners of the her, so this quality can come up with a new design that meets Title 21 requirements. So, regarding the conditions, so we have the conditions listed there, but two are already met, and the parking was met long ago. So, should they even be on there as a condition? We, we would ask they not be on there. That was our original request, and I think that Dean and Brian and Dave kind of decided that they wanted to keep it on there, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but it, that was under our understanding. Um, but we, we, we don't see why it needs to be on there because the revocation of the permission to act happened after, long after, the first. Parking plan was created, which is one that you have in front of you. And plus, they're already mapped, though. It, it, yeah. Um, we, there have been pre two previous cases that already have kind of approved uh, plan, so all we're asking is for this one, once it gets approved by assembly, they just go ahead and get a, a plan approved by the traffic department and submit it. So, it all, just all three cases will be consistent with the parking plan. Oh, so there's a parking plan approved for the previous two, but not this yeah, one. Well, it's the exact same parking plan. Right right now, it's the same parking plan for all three licenses. Is there a reason why you don't want that removed? Um, <coughs> well, I think the reason is because the property owner has rescinded the approval of the parking layout. And for us to ensure that they meet the necessary parking, we would like the, the traffic department to look at it and verify that they have parking for all the uses on the property. Um, this is really, in, in planning's uh, position, um, it's somewhat of, a, of an issue to be resolved with the, the property owner. Um, it's, it's similar to a, a strip mall, so to speak, for, um, for the number of uh, parking spaces to be provided on the property, the planning department simply looks to see all that all uses um, have park, the necessary parking. We don't necessarily go in and say, well, you know, this use is allocated, uh, you know, this many spaces in this, we don't do that. Um, similar situation with Eli's uh, landlord, she's restricting the number of, of spaces, but the site provides the, ne the necessary parking meet the minimum requirements of Title 21. So uh, it's a bit of a, a sticky situation, honestly. So we we feel like it's a it's a civil matter to be resolved between the, the tenant and the landlord. However, we would like the, the traffic department to take a second look at the parking plan to make sure that all the parking, uh, parking requirements are met. So what happens if, um, yeah, when they take a second look and <coughs> the landlord's involved and they come up with a different parking plan? They have to go back and mend the other two, like um, yeah. land use agreements. I, I would I would say that yes, they do, but it would be minor enough that we could do it administratively, unless uh, the assembly deemed it necessary to come back. Okay. Yeah. I, I would just want to point out. I want to make sure that we're understanding that this letter from the landlord it says, "I acknowledge on, on August 27, 2017, on behalf of the Crown Bees LLC, I gave permission to Black Bear Enterprise and its members." to act as my representative when applying for all required applications from the state of Alaska and the municipality of Anchorage. I hereby rescind and revoke on behalf of Amber Crumbs LLC and myself all powers and permissions to act as a representative. So it doesn't actually say we're revoking the currently approved parking plan. It just says from this date, April 10th forward, we have debt. 
I agree with that. I agree with what was actually said in the letter, but what I think was said in the letter and what actually is meant, because we actually called the attorney and and we, we asked him about that because there is some inconsistencies mm -hmm. in that letter that are very vague and unclear. Um, and it, I think it's their intent to revoke the, the parking, uh, the approval of the parking plan, not just for this particular license, but for, for the other two as well. The two are um, I mean, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to revoke it for this one, but not the other two. It just, I mean, I understand, uh, Dana, what it says, mm -hmm. but what the intent is might be something different. So. Uh, I, well, I have a hard time kind of with that because, I mean, this is what we have to rely on, the notarized letter from the landlord. What the intent is should be reflected in this letter. I don't think we should speculate on as to the intent. Well, I can tell you that I had a conversation with okay. the with the attorney, and that's what he told me. So, and just to go back on, on what Dave said, um, traffic already reviewed the plan. You have a copy of stamp to prove the existing plan. So, yep. is there a need to have them review it again? Because they've already reviewed it for you know one building permit, one review. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. And I, like I said, it's it's very similar situation to a strip mall where in we don't necessarily dictate the number of parking stalls um, allocated to a certain uh, tenant. We just make sure that the site itself has ample parking. Which we can. Um, I agree, I agree. So to go back to your original question, yes, I, I would say we have met that requirement for number seven. The Department of Parking has an approved traffic um, layout, practical layout for traffic engineer. I, I did speak to Ryan yesterday and I did understand the intent of to keep those items in there, but I would agree that if, if we can take them out of there, it would resolve some issues. It would resolve the burden on us from the landlord and the leverage that she has on us to pay for her repairs. And we can work that out. So we really, we're here to comply with the regulations to the special land use permit Title 21. If that's something she wants to negate or bypass, that should be on her and not on us. Um, I was just going to mention the timing here is uh, important immediately because the uh, attorneys for the landowners uh, that are trying to do a rescission of their authorization, it's not something that can be retroactive. So if you know, it was their authorized agent for the owner up until that rescission, so all well, the prior acts, the approval of two prior applications, the parking plan is submitted. You can't really undo those things, but the decision effective at that date of that letter on April 11th, um, this application isn't done, so it's the owner does add, I guess, links in this parking plan can't be forward before this application is approved. We can't undo what was already done. So legally, it's really sticking to us. And um, like Dave has said, it's between the private property owners, they need to sort that out. So I think the condition seven that they proposed it covers any way this could go in terms of how we find the pool or having a parking plan. It's how we got it. So, so I agree legally with Dean. However, you know if the if the parking layout changes as a result of this permit, uh, it obviously affects the two permits previous. So legally, I, I would agree, you can't really go back and, and relook at the two. But I think that because the license are, the three licenses are related, that you should update the two previous to reflect the actual parking layout that would be done as part of this permit. I mean, just from a, a consistency standpoint, it seems to make sense. I understand where Dean's coming from legally, though. Okay, so I think from our views, we can, what we've often done is, you know, if we move this forward as it is and leave those in here, basically puts it on your laps to just resolve it. And we assume you will, and when you do, it all moves on, we don't hear anything. Um, alternative is, okay, we think these requirements, six and seven, are already met, and at the meeting we say, well, let's remove those. And what does that do? Well, that helps you some. It helps us a lot. 
And just because we've met them and we get some leverage with them in order to force this into paying $100,000 for them to build it. Yeah, it's basically just using this approval over their heads. It's kind of like a pretext argument where, oh, I don't agree with the parking, and by the way, he fixed the roof, he fixed the water, he didn't need to pay for the sprinkler system. Well, that gets us into stuff where we don't belong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's, that's where we were originally. You know, we, like I said, we likened it to the strip mall situation. Um, you know, we think there's a civil matter to be resolved between the tenant and the landlord. Uh, we, we're fine with the condition. We're also fine without. So. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Just let it go forward with the conditions on it. Let them fight out in court. So you would leave the conditions on the conditions on there. My problem is they already approved two of the other ones. And now this landlord at the last minute does took permission away on this one. She wants to put them between a rock and a hard spot. So we have to remove conditions on that. <laughs> well, they they had an approved parking plan, uh, and so the landlord is saying he wants to take or one she wants to take one parking spot away because he wants to put. So and then like some kind of weird concrete Jersey barrier, yeah, Jersey barrier because. Yeah. And so if the question is for me, is there still enough parking to meet the requirements? If she puts that comment, she's not allowed to put those things on there. No, you're not. Just like the strip mall, you can't yeah. put comments and say you can't use these spaces yeah. because you're not paying for repair. Right? Just show up and give her a ticket. Well, it's really it's really it's really it's 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 Here, hold on. This piece should be more organized. Sorry. Yeah. Chair, chair should take control, I think. But uh, <laughs> um, so potentially it may not be a total robot because that snow storage area has a little extra space. The connex, if she goes 40 foot, that's going to be hard to squeeze in anyway. She's not allowed to do that. There's none of the construction and maneuvering um, in that space to put a comic to Jersey Burgers. You know, now we're traffic engineering for a few hours, but this. And, and they said, I mean, what my wife said, it's not allowed according to Title 21 to drop a comic on your apartment space because it's a municipality of Anchorage. Uh, so I, I guess I'm a little confused. We already have an approved, two approved mm -hmm. parking plans, and as Dean pointed out, uh, that's, that should be legally binding on this landlord, right? Because they, at that time, they were their legal uh, agent. So would they be violating the prior approved, it, if they did this thing with the Connex, imagine they could do it with Title 21, are there still enough remaining parking spots where they'd be complying with the prior parking plans? Or are they like intentional, or are they gonna be vi in violation of the prior approved parking plans? I think if you look at the, the prior approved plans, they meet the parking requirement. Even if they take away some spots using a if they, barrier. If they barrier. take away, then, then they'd be deficient. Well, then they can't do that. If they're, I mean, if they, if they were the legal agent at the time, then they're going to voluntarily violate the prior parking plans. And they have not just an issue with them, it seems like they have an issue with us, too. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. The landlords, too. No. Why? Why? Because yeah, they, I, they were their legal agents, they signed an agreement with the with the municipality, and now they're voluntarily going to break that. That that is between those two parties and not us. Yeah, I would say it's a civil matter. It's a civil Even matter. Even though they were signing on that their is, behalf. That is that is between the two parties, not us. Chris, would you remind the landlord that you cannot put a connex in that? Spot? <laughs> I would love to. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. See, I've seen it before. I can't drop a connex. I'm here to trying more. to get it out. I know. I want to let them know ahead of time you can't do that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. I would just say, you know, just to keep the whole mess <coughs> away from the community, is, you know, don't don't include the summer seven because it's already been resolved. If it's already been resolved, it's already been resolved. And then if the landlord has an issue with us, we will, you know, handle that. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so that's what we'll do. So we'll move this forward. 
Tuesday, Tuesday with the recommendation that we take the old seven up there. That's a condition. That's a second condition. That's not going to be done. You know, I think that's the same way. It's a street. It's a street. It's a street. And I want to do approved parking plan. Very few places that have arranged a lot of things. A mudslide. It'll happen in the parking lot. It's an area where you're going to get that change in the condition. It's not going to be a part of the survival. Okay, next up is lightning strike. It's based on the what's available at the time. Lucky strike, yeah, it's not a cigarette. Lucky strike, lucky strike. They still make those? I don't know. They still do. I'm not sure they do. You're talking big man. Do you want to explain it? So, since lightning strike organics, it's a limited cultivation. Um, There's a caretaker facility with this application. Um, all of the general licensing requirements were addressed in the operating plan. Um, we didn't receive any comments from the health department regarding the licensing requirements. No access fees or fines were found due, uh, and there was no recommended conditions added to the licensing. Thank you. And this is Sean. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, Dr. Malone here, he's, uh, he came to our counter about a year and a half, almost two years ago, <laughs> yeah. and he's been slowly easing into it. Um, he's gone up through the, pretty much the whole permitting process. So Lightning Strike Organics is applying for a special land use permit for marijuana cultivation within the I-1 district. Uh, this facility will be occupying 1,500 square feet within the existing building. It used to be a glass studio. It's located southwest of the intersection of East 94th Avenue and Old Stewart Highway. And his planned business hours are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. Uh, his, um, it meets the setbacks, applicable setbacks for I-1 property. Uh, the petition site snow storage space is provided. He's dedicated a pedestrian walkway uh, that's separate from the vehicle access up to the road. Uh, the site meets the parking requirements with four spaces provided, as well as one van accessible space. Shooting uh, Electric Association. Um, they provided a letter stating that the electric capacity of the facility had insufficient. He's through has done all his updates in the meantime with that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, he drew has several non-conforming rights that have been established for the property. Uh, his project costs exceed the thresholds for 2112 bringing characteristics into compliance. And he's just going to be required to devote 10% of his project costs for bringing the site into compliance. He has submitted to planning a detailed cost estimate for all the improvements that demonstrate this standard has been met. Like I said, he's already gone through the building permit process and he's pretty much ready to go. Uh, he's provided all the necessary application submittal materials and the planning department has found those to be in compliance. And they recommend approval of a special land use permit subject to the conditions that are in the staff report. He's aware of the caretaker residence I'll let Drew kind of explain how he's going to handle that. Okay. Uh, the caretaker residence uh, is in the second floor. Um, it's, uh, it hasn't been occupied for years. It's at this point uh, been just a storage office area. Um, and I don't really foresee in the near future anybody using that as a residence. Um, and so that's where that sits. But the requirement that it be a employee here yeah. or you right, right, right. Yeah, there. It's, it's me or a caretaker for the downstairs business for the only thing. I I wouldn't want anything else in there. Yeah. Any thoughts? Squish with Bill. Well, I see there's a letter in here saying they need the requirements for power. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing else we need to do for power, right? No, they uh, they did require an upgrade, but it's been done already. So. Good. That's there unusual because normally, it's, when they come to us, it's still a long time, so it's good they got the power done. It uh, depends upon the willingness to spend the money in advance versus waiting until they're well, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, there there was the option to take the action on. Well, he did. I think the community council has a. Yes, that was quite a while ago. I uh, went through the community council. Uh, you were there, you might remember that, but it's been a long time. I saw your name on there. 
Yeah, and uh, so they had, they really expressed no reservations at the time. Um, I don't think that's changed. So if there was one yeah, opposition? I, I got a letter from someone. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find it. Um, it, they seemed to be confused about what was happening. They were concerned about sales in the area. They didn't think that was appropriate. Um, but of course, I'm not sales. I'm a cultivation. So um, they're at the at the. I held the two public meetings. I held one. Um, uh, I held two because one was not didn't have the required length of time for notification, but I wanted to get to the community council early, which really didn't matter at that point, I realize now, but I was making an effort. And so uh, to, to uh, satisfy the requirements of notice time, I did hold another public meeting. Uh, no one at either public meeting was there to express any reservations. I have a question on, so the one, the, the one with the 21 day notice, how, how did you advertise that? Um, uh, I posted it uh, in a couple places there in the neighborhood, and uh, I think, and did the mailing, of course. And the original industry president did the Because it was interesting, everybody on the sinus team was from the industry, and a great show of solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple people there who were from the industry. Is that right? Yeah. Going down the list. But not but many. Not many. Not many. Yeah. So they didn't sign in. But there was one written comment that it must have been in response to the city's there was. Right. Yep. But so what they're talking about is the residences across the other side of Old Stewart Highway. Yes, yeah, between Old Stewart and Old Stewart Highway. Right, and that's four lanes, pretty busy street. It's a run with the addresses, and yeah, it was over like 2,000 feet away. It's also in the And that's straight line. Okay, any thoughts? Let's move to approve it. Can I mention it for a good second? Okay, so we'll move forward on Tuesday. We'll, when this comes up, we'll say that this committee recommended a I want to express my regrets if you're closing down the glass. And doing the other one. Yeah, well, a lot of people have. <laughs> uh, it's 42 or 43 years in that location, so uh, it was well established. And, uh, uh, but unfortunately, originally, you know, I was trying to permit upstairs, which was a really a problem because I wanted to keep the glass shop in there. But I came to a realization last couple of years that the, the business was on a downhill run. It's, you know, it's 42 years of the cycle, I think. And, uh, so, unfortunately, I decided that I would have liked to have kept it. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you. See you Tuesday. Great. Hey, John. Yeah. Is that the last item on the agenda? No, with the no. state stuff's coming up. Okay, good. <laughs> your name's all over the stuff, Chris. Right? I'm sorry, I didn't get your vote on that last one. No objection. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the next one um, is violations of odor. And we've got a list. What's it, Mandy? Do you want to go through this? Or um, So, just to get 
But so Danish Gardens continues to have trouble and their system wasn't designed by a mechanical um, Danish Gardens, we did take the hearing over the other issues and their compliance date from the hearing officer was the 21st. And we've been, every, every week date we've been in the area and have not uh, detected odor. So, of course, so, so uh, <coughs> we are planning on keeping it open maybe another week and then we're going to close the case um, until we get another complaint. But so far, so good. So. Oh, okay, so there was a problem, but it seems like it may have been. We hope so. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, Canna Baskets or Alaska Sense has, has got some issues, and I know they've been working it. They've been buying a lot of different parts and building it. They still have, have some issues with that one. Yeah. Did you guys go and get some electronic equipment to detect odor? There's one available out there, some noise ranger. We saw that about two years ago. Did you guys find to get one? Because it says you can't smell it, but nose is very from person to person. True. Sure. I would like, is there a standard out there? Do you have an electronic machine that can do that, or do you guys just not buy one? We're just, no, we, we have not bought one. Um, okay. we, you know. What do we need to do to help you guys get one? Because that would at least have some standard to be utilized, because nose is very. Well, the way the code is written, it's just any order at the property line, and, and that, I think, is, is uh, pretty simple. If you can smell it at the property line, it's a by normal nose. A normal nose, yeah. So what's a normal nose? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in most cases like that, with, this, with the with the odor, we always go at least two of us. You know, just to Did you guys look into electronic methods for a nose analyzer? I know it exists out there because there's lots more items on it. Mm -hmm. Just let us know what it would cost to get one here in the city. Okay. Because I'm trying to figure out some way to do it so some parts can be done. If you would, please. Sure, you can. Thank you, John. Got a question I do actually, yeah. thank you. Um, do you think the odor that people detect really emanates not through the exhaust system, but basically leaking through the walls of buildings that were never, in most cases, built to contain odor? I think it can do both. Both. Um, okay. The Danish Garden building, the Danish Gardens building. It's a quite large building. I think that's what they've been fighting down there. I think we've been you know, doing everything we can, but it is an older building. I think it's kind of a drafty building. I think it's kind of both issues. We have a brand new case that's come in um, that, that came in this week that we're, doing, that we're looking at, and that is strictly an internal thing. It's, it's, a, it's a, an industrial condo type unit. It's basically creeping in, in the, all the units in the building and coming out. Um, we have found that the bill that towards an issue that I think nobody expected to come up was simply going in and out of the buildings will we'll, we'll, we'll let odor out. You're going to get a purge when, say, well, what happened? We had one facility that they had had an odor issue at one time. They put a lot of money into fixing the problem. I went by at a certain time of day and I got some order from the building and went back and talked to them and said, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what's going on, <coughs> you know, what, what was going on right at this time, and they said, well, we're going to lunch. So they had 10 to 15 people leaving within that, within that window. And then in another instance, I went <coughs> by uh, um, another facility and I got to know, you know, what we're going when I was going by came around the block and there was two of their employees had the door to the grill area propped open smoking cigarettes, but they wanted the warm air coming from the inside but also <laughs> it's perfect building. So I don't think anybody really thought that was gonna I mean it's gonna happen. I mean but it's uh, like on the one great northern, you know, they're very close to Danish Garden, so we've been very careful down there as far as differentiating okay, where is the heat or is the odor coming from. And with them it was that you know, there's gonna be a half hour window from like eleven thirty to twelve that you're probably gonna get some odor from them. Mm -hmm. They've got approximately fifteen employees going to lunch. Um, and I think that's gonna happen with with any place that you know, because you have to get that, that warm air in there and it's, you know, it's pressurized a little bit, so just opening the door, you're gonna get some odor coming out. Mm -hmm. um, but once the door closes, it, it goes away very quickly and it's not detectable on the property line after that. Thanks, Court.
Are these uh, violations or these observations due to basically municipal employees' inspections, or are these complaint driven? I mean, because just thinking about where they're located. You know, they're generally pretty removed from other commercial or residential areas. Right. So they are still yes. complaints. So yes. is it other industrial uses in the area or is it like passers by or do other, other, other neighbors? Interesting. So are they watching them in there? Okay, it's lunch time, watch them all come out and call the No, it's actually like Danish Gardens that I don't know what the problem was. I know, you know, Mr. Roberts went to a lot of money on different filters and stuff and hopefully he's he's got it. I know there was uh, adjacent property owner. Um, it's not well. The adjacent, immediately adjacent, is also a, they have a cold landlord, but um, the other one's probably a hundred feet away. But it was, it was very strong, mm -hmm. and they um, they had a uh, well, it's Carlos Tree Services who it is. Um, it, they the words workers' comp claim were actually used in saying we got to get we got to get this under control because a couple of their mechanics. In the summertime, with warm, were getting noxious. I mean, it was they were very strong. I mean, it can be very strong. I mean, some of them, you know, it's <coughs> the Anchorage is listed down here with a bunch of problems with inventory drinking since 2017. Did they finally solve that problem? Uh, as far as I know, that the state was pursuing those issues. I think they did. Okay. So. Is this um, this is all violations because you know, we have a lot more, so many more state than city. Right. Is it, um, are they just calling the state first? Well, no, we've done the states basically. Whoever initiated, whoever mm -hmm. takes the call initially, it sticks with them. So if we get the call on the odor, the state may, you know, may have do a joint inspection with us, but you know, we'll be the lead. But that's what we were with. Uh, Danish cars, we did our hearing first. I'm not sure what the state's got going on with them. Yeah, we, just, we just basically did our hearing with, with you guys, mm -hmm. and then um, part of the administrative uh, law judge order was we could mitigate some of the fees by putting more into the mm -hmm. building, and that's what they did. Um, so they still paid part of the fee, which is like a thousand bucks, and then did like, I can't remember how much was the improvement to the building. So I'm glad I did it's been working. Um, and then the state didn't take any action on it. Just, uh, we wrote a letter and I updated them about the municipality hearings that we've been doing. So I, well, I'm just curious on the mechanism though. So if someone smells, they go by any operation, I smell or a neighbor complains. I mean, our thing is, oh, they call for law enforcement to react, but it looks like they're calling the state first. I mean, what's so uh, what our neighbors? Well, they're calling both. I mean, right. like Cindy, Cindy Carlos, for example, she has our. Our number, email address, and then also Jane Coulter. So what she does is she, they have a strong odor of marijuana. She sends an email out to both of us. <coughs> Cindy, Cindy Carlos, the complainant, just as an example. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. In that particular case, okay. um, and, and she's okay with us, us identifying her. She actually came to her, so I'm not disclosing the complainant's name. But but the state will, unlike unlike code enforcement, they will, without a complaint from the public, they'll go over and just see on their own. Like Richard or Lane will give me, well, at least Lane will still call me sometimes and be like, hey, I just passed a can of basket, by the way. It kind of smells, you want to give them a heads up to, to look at that. Um, instead of just writing us a, a complaint. Um, the complaints, I think, for the media are just strictly public driven. And then the state has, goes and they pop around a lot just to see what they can find. <coughs> we, actually pop, we actually pop around a lot, too. <laughs> so, uh, we're a lot opportunity as far as keeping a. Uh, Monitoring the different different cultivation facilities, um, we, we do you know visit the property lines to see if we're getting over from them. And, um, and like I said, the vast majority are not having issues. Okay. There's a few that are, and we are working it out. Manny, do we get notification by the control board great for these violations, like we do with alcohol violations? Yes. Just want to make sure we've got those stacks as we do a renew and license. We want to be able to see if. If an individual is having multiple complaints on how they've been handled, yeah. we're going to have that come into back up. Correct. We will have all of the um, paperwork with it. Um, I get that from the state, and then we'll compile everything from land use as well. So all of that will be um, attached to the renewal. Because I want to treat this the same way we treat alcohol when it's their license come up renewal. We want to have the violations there so we can get it done. So there are some cases 
you say we have operations side by side or very, very close. So are you okay and able to discern that that smell comes from one, not the other? Yes. Do we have some, we have some off of this place we just looked at and that uh, might be Bonanza Street. We've got Bonanza Street. Some are right. somewhere down, some industrial area, there's mm -hmm. like two of the same strip mall warehouse. Look at everything. A lot of a lot of your senses. You look at the wind direction. You know, and in this particular case, um, if you look at a lot of the chimney in the winter time. You look at you know flow coming out of the chimneys and the vents, and you see you get the wind direction, and then you, know, you just feel along your body which direction the wind is moving from, and then you just move around the neighborhood. Uh, like Danish Gardens in Great uh, Northern, as far as the buildings go, they're less hundred yards or less, you know, a little apart, but you know, you can basically keep, keep follow it upstream. You know, there is, there, you know, as you go this direction, is the snow getting stronger? Well, yes, it is. But if you're going that direction, it's it's weakening or it's going wet. But the, the wind direction was a, was a big help. Um, and then when it was cold, you know, the you know, chimneys were uh, being used. And then there's some flag <coughs> theory too that. Someone told me that in one of these areas where there's more than one somewhat close, that there's also an illegal grow, and that that's the one that's making the smell. So uh, I went, I went in all those buildings, and there's not. Okay. So that was that was brought to our attention, and so we went this route just went in all the adjacent buildings, especially the one that uh, NMRV is occupying. That's the building we were told to grow, and there may have been one in there at one time, but there is not now. Good, thank you. Anything else on this? So I think it's just something to track, but we'll get periodically reports. I think, I think Ryan or something, is he going to report periodically or do we have some deal? Um, I think it's maybe easier for the clerk's office to do okay. it. I think we could do an AIM similar like the tow yeah, report. Yeah, we could do it, say, a quarterly report like the tow identical to the towing industry. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. I don't think we need it. How, how often do we do towing? Quarterly. Quarterly. So this last um, thing, I'll let Dean kind of lead the discussion, but it came up, um, I think Janet highlighted the question on what is, are licenses transferable? And in the code, we say very, very clearly that licenses are not transferable. And later on, we say, here's how you can transfer a license. So there, things aren't exactly right. So what we emailed out was a combination of things. Um, so it's very rough brainstorming level. One was kind of, she was just my thoughts on this and what our goals were with the license, but I wasn't here when we made these rules. And then you have three versions. Um, Mandy took two cracks and straightened it out, and then I took a crack at it too. So you have three versions, and I think the main message from those is it can be complicated. <laughs> so Dean is gonna make it uncomplicated for us. Mm. And are you guys, are you gonna have much, did you get a chance to read? Uh, Some this. of what got sent out? Uh, this, not this. What, what do you hold? Uh, everything that was on the um, agenda that got me sent out. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, at one point it was, okay, so you probably have this stuff Mandy did and not the one that I did, which will be fine. All of this is very, very preliminary, so it's not something to be introduced. Okay. Um, thanks, Mr. Chen. So, uh, transfers. I guess I should first say I'm not sure, um, John, but I'm gonna think you don't count here. So, I'm gonna try to kind of come to the these things. So, I made a little presentation to try to just make it clear as to what the current code says. And, um, I can probably stand up. I guess I have three points I want to discuss. Actually, when the disclaimer, uh, this is just for discussion purposes. I'm not giving you the access to what you can do in the just for discussion as to what the current code means. Um, so it's interpretations on the authorized word we just that to this discussion. I tried to put a disclaimer on this slide uh, here, but it's, I guess, drowned out in some gray. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the Alaska Code and Municipal Code and how they're different uh, purposes or exhibitions in some examples. So on the second page, I've got the state of Alaska regulation 
and it's language and the bottom slide, the bottom <coughs> speed level. The only difference between these two is um, a marijuana establishment license isn't in the municipal code, says Mayor, uh, transfer control of interest in the municipal code. We skipped the words uh, transfer marijuana establishment license, which is in state recognition. So the whole intent, we up the next page, was, um, oh, excuse me. Uh, actually, the next page, it makes clear in section 1080-10E that um, a license is not transferable, but it doesn't prohibit uh, transfer of person's interest. So this is just code language. Uh, we'll get to what that all means. We need an exception here where a sole proprietorship, an individual luxury person, wants a license, they can transfer the license to an uh, LFC business entity as long as the business entity is 100% owned by that sort of same individual. So we encountered that situation before. So our next slide, the whole purpose with uh, enacting the code this way was to um, prohibit the growth of the secondary market uh, with um, marijuana licenses. And to compare it to, for example, um, the taxi cab industry or the liquor license, state liquor license industry. Uh, people sell them on the secondary market with an increase in value. Their license fees a thousand dollars, for example, but on the secondary market, eighty thousand dollars for the right to have liquor license and so on and so forth. And so the assembly, when we were looking at enacting all these regulations and making some true statement, we don't want secondary market to grow um, out of their one licenses and transfers. So prohibiting license transfer was the approach. There's some uh, key differences between marijuana license industry and liquor licenses from the state and tax cap uh, permits. For example, it would be a limited uh, cap on the number of permits tax caps available, makes the value increase. And we don't have a cap on the number of marijuana licenses in the city. I guess you could say there's an effective cap for the land use and zoning restrictions of public place. But what number is that? I'm not sure, but it's finite at some point. Um, well, just for the purposes out here. So, uh, what does this code mean? And I, um, we've gotten questions from time to time, and I tried to lay out some examples. And my next few slides with transfers of a license or controlling interest actually in a license. If it's a partnership or if it's a limited liability company or corporation. Uh, in doing this, I started to feel like the captain obvious in some ways. The real purpose here is um, people can transfer their shares, their own partnership shares to someone else. The name on the license, for example, if it's Pangea Partnership, that name can't change. That's the name associated with the license. Uh, the yeah, code provisions we have say anybody who has direct, direct, direct financial interest uh, has to be a licensee. So, however, the uh, interests are owned. I'm sorry, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. This is either explain the way to guide the other people. We have, you know, a, uh, example, uh, uh, in call cannabis LLC is the license owner. If you have uh, two owners, that's easy, A and B. Uh, perhaps A is an LLC as well, five additional owners. You can play this shell game here, and that's very really common in the business world. It's corporate shell games, you have a whole bunch of holding companies and so forth. Somewhere at the end of the line is a natural person at one point that owns interests in, in companies in the shell game. So all natural persons have some indirect financial interest in the license, ultimately, they all need that criminal background shot and so forth. Um, so what, well, what does this all mean? We're not prohibiting the show game. You know, people can do that. They know, see corporation which interests. Transferring uh, less than controlling interest requires a certain court. Transferring controlling interest requires the application and approval. So uh, I guess this all comes down to basically um, you can't change the name associated with the license. You can change everything else, all the other interests and that name. Does this prohibit the secondary market? And it's really difficult to see how it does. You can transfer my 50% share in a uh, partnership or LLC and become valuable because it's a successful marijuana establishment business. 
you've got a secondary market there because of, um, I mean, you don't have such a good business, it's not so valuable. But it's not because, I guess, it's not, it's not, um, I don't think the secondary market standard is by what we've done. So uh, the question here is all at the bottom of my um, page five slide. Is the secondary market prevented? I am not so sure I can say, and should it be, and that's where we come to address the issues that you outlined and suggested changes to come to either go one way or the other or make changes so we're really more effectively prohibit the secondary market. Can that really be achieved? I can't answer that question. Um, or should we just give up and say, no, transfers are okay. The state can transfer their licenses. They approve the transfers. If uh, it's being transferred, you have to go and get approval, go do a background check and all that. So why shouldn't we do that with municipal licenses? I guess there's some administrative concerns. If uh, state approves a license transfer with municipal license associated with the same business and facility, we don't approve it, they have to change, uh, revoke the license plan or new meeting day. Then you've got different license numbering systems being created, and maybe that's not. I guess the buildings demonstrated the convenience. Um, so I hope I'm helping clarify that there's an issue here on how the answers to how to solve this issue. But, but as you can see, we can go in two different directions trying for the secondary market with additional code changes or um, make code changes so we're more aligned with allowing transfers and licenses of like the studios. Uh, so I, you said the state does allow transfer of the licenses. Does it, is it still bound to a single location, or can you move it the way you can for what your license? Yeah. They're both tied to specific locations. There's a code section that says you can't change the location for a license. So that to me is a pretty critical distinction between these licenses and taxi permits, and I believe some kind of liquor licenses as well. If you if it's uncapped. <coughs> and tied to a location, then I don't see how you're going to have a functioning secondary market, um, whether it's legal or not. On the other hand, the idea that you could sell a successful business, I don't think that's something we should try to prevent. No. I, I see that, too. It's, I don't see how there could be a secondary market for the license, but the businesses should grow or not. And with this industry, since they can't get loans, to get money, they sell equity. So, and you'll see equity change. And we saw one that had about 30 partners gate and you'd assume that at some point some people are going to want in and out but it's about the business not that license really and if we do anything to restrict their ability to get money I mean, my biggest fear in this is if you have a few businesses that start struggling and they get desperate and they don't follow the rules and then the whole industry is in big trouble so we want to be very careful not to restrict their ability to get money with anything we have to <coughs> thank you mr chairman uh so what we're seeing in some other markets, what I'm reading, is there's consolidation going on, where some of the more successful marijuana businesses are buying some smaller, less successful businesses. And have, have we seen any of that taking place in our uh, area? Yeah. I mean, there's people that have, especially, especially, there's people that have talked about that. Um, for doing that. I think Greg Northern probably will see as being any one of those to do those kind of things. Yet, but right now, not yet. Um, and I, that's why I raised this issue. I have a hard time explaining to my clients, yes or no, you can transfer part of your ownership interest without violating the uni regulations. Um, because like if people want to go take care of their sick mom in Florida, I mean, they can't have a marijuana interest that's going to be gone in more than 108 days. So they have to sell that interest and hopefully get some money from it. But if they can't do that, they're going to kind of... I remember when we started this, we did not want a secondary market. And part of this the state's process, they'll issue just as darn many licenses as people ask for. Unlike alcohol, where they restrict the amount that you have, there is no state restriction on licenses. We could have 200,000 licenses if people want to lose their money doing that. But the state is trying to make sure there's no secondary market. That's the reason I think Fairbanks is trying to go to some regulated system where they only have so many licenses. Safe. We're not doing that here. Right, so I think you you sort of identified it uh, perversely. If you if you do put that cap, you create that secondary market.
Okay. Yeah. So by leaving it uncapped, while some people are upset with that, we, no there's no intrinsic value in the license. So, well, I guess what, what Janet said, though, I thought is a little confusing, because if I was understanding what Dean was saying, it is permissible now to sell your interest. So I'm curious why some people think that they can't. You can't sell the license, but you can sell your stake in the LLC or your so, could you sell role the name? In the, what's that? Could you sell the name of your business? Well, you would sell the business, and the name would come with it. But the name, the name is there. I mean, I, I, I don't know about like franchises. I don't know like how that stuff works. But, um, but yeah. So Jan, I mean, why, why do you think some of you, your clients are worried that they can't sell their stake in these companies? Because if and Manny, help me if I'm misreading this, but if you sell a controlling part of the interest, then doesn't it cancel your marijuana license, your marijuana union license? Uh, okay, so if it's controlling interest, what's well, this must be applied for and approved by yeah. assembly? So it's yeah, cancel, so be able to go through an application. The interest can be transferred. So the ownership of an LLC can be transferred, um, and along with that, the license, right. basically. Um, so at least right now, how it's written, all of those kinds of transfers of the ownership of the business can be done. And they are either approved by the assembly or administratively if it's not a controlling interest. But um, our discussion kind of came about that being that they can do those transfers and controlling interest of the ownership of the business, essentially it's the transfer of the license. So it has to stay the same license number and it has to have some of the same um, licensees that they can transfer and so, I mean, depending on how many transfers and who changes hands, it could essentially become an entirely new ownership under the same LLC, but that LLC still owns it. So we were kind of discussing, is this actually um, doing what the assembly intended when they and that was the other wanted part. to prohibit transfers of license, mm -hmm. licenses? But I remember the discussion with the assembly here about this, and then so when I read it, and then it just seemed conflicting. It seemed like the assembly said one thing, and then it seems like this says another thing. So I just wanted, I want to know if we can transfer interests, and there's no issue there, cool. But that's not what I remember the assembly kind of debating. Oh, do you have an ordinance last year that makes some COVID beats? And uh, I think before the code seems not the same, but it seems that changed me last year. We went into the Cold War and we went into the same thing. So I've been looking for food to it, so before that change, we went to the same thing, which is 17 years ago. Yeah. Something like that. So maybe that switch from food to food didn't change the end of the year, that's what they said. But then the question is, do you have the secondary market? Yes, I mean, the secondary market is still there, and I'm not sure if that's just if we want to take that away. But then the other part of it too is like, okay, so if you can only sell the LLC and you can't take the, uh, the license out as an asset to sell to a different LLC, then that original LLC still has all the you know, liabilities and whatnot tied to it. And then a new owner might not want to deal with that. Um, they might not want to step into an existing business and might just want to purchase an asset. And that might be what the assembly really didn't want. That, and, that's, and that seems to be prohibited. And I just, we just wanted some clarification. So I think I've bounced around a lot with Dean and Mandy on this issue, and I think I kind of was confused. I, I think there are confuses, and a couple of things that clearly um, come out of it. But in the code, we say establishment can't be operated unless it has an applicable marijuana establishment license. So to me, okay, the license goes with this marijuana establishment. We define what those are. We say it's a cultivation, a testing, retail, or uh, manufacturing. So it seems like you read this, okay, the license goes with this operation. Then we say, look, we're no longer, it's not transferable, and we say a license is issued to an individual, even though it really seems like it's tied to the business, not an individual. We said it's not transferable, but then a little bit later we say an application for transfer of a license is this, this, this. So you can transfer it, so it's a little confusing. <coughs> and it's confusing to industry. I mean, Janice says they're confused, but you can obviously, just in the two cases we looked at earlier, uh, in one, Eli signed a letter, and he designated himself designated licensee. So he's the licensee, but really it's the LLC that he's operating under. Mm -hmm. It's not him, but it's so confusing, he's not clear. And in Drew, he, the 
let's see, it, uh, oh, discussing the caretaker thing. So it's not, but it said, so in our code it says, who can live in a caretaker residence, licensees, affiliate, or an employee. But a licensee is really, could be an individual, but it could be an LLC. An LLC occupies a caretaker residence, that doesn't make sense. So there's a lot of confusion in here that we could tighten up. And, and I think because a license is tied with the business, really, there's an unlimited number. You don't really, how, how do you create a secondary market for that? Even if we limited the number, it's with that business. It's inseparable from the success or failure of that business. So the value of that license is, is it a failing business? Not so much. It's a booming business. It's really related to the business. So what I was looking at, I went through and tried to weed it, sort it out, so that we completely removed. License goes with the establishment, and then all this change of LLC and ownership is really about the business. And I just use the phrase marijuana establishment because that's where we start with. We say a license is issued to marijuana establishment in those four different styles. So I tried to clear it up that way. I didn't have all of the code, but you really have to go through the whole thing and clean that up. But I think if we had some direction on this, and we could leave it the same and deal with the confusion. Um, Mandy tried to just take out, we, we say they're transferable. Okay, we don't say they're not, and that could work too. And then I was going more towards the licenses with the business, whoever owns it, whatever it's called, It's because they're stuck with that special land use permit in the location. They're really licenses tied to the business and to the special land use permit. And just make that crystal clear that all this ownership change is just talks about the business, which is typical. That's how most, most of the, the business world works. But it'll take a lot of little changes throughout this code. I mean, even if you look at like C, uh, 1080046C5, you know, in the section ownership change means an ownership change is defined in the subsection does not include the transfer of the municipality license, which is prohibited by section 108001E. So I'm just kind of like, ooh, let me, like, which so I, don't, I, I don't get it. If I can add to it. It, that's a clear example of what I think John was describing, which is one thing is an asset, and if you choose, if you own a retail license and business, and you wish to sell that to another entity, you are selling the business, you are not selling the license. The person who wishes to buy the business has to apply for a new license. So, at least with the muni. Correct. Yeah, with the muni owner. I'm not talking about the state. But so that may be true, we had one business that had some 30 owners, and they're changing, they've already made some changes. That's different. There is no change of ownership in that case. There is a change of membership of the Limited Liability Corporation. That's an entirely separate issue. As long as the controlling interest in that does not change to the degree. So if everybody in this room is an equal owner of the LLC, and then half of us decide to sell to you, John, that, may, that changes the controlling interest of the LLC and would be a trigger for this because uh, the, the, the authority, the power, the, the clearance to do this is now resting primarily off of you. Um, in the code as it's currently drafted, there are, a few, there are very few prohibitions on who can or cannot have a license, but those have to be tested. And if the ownership structure of an LLC changes and the member who is now the controlling interest triggers any of those prohibitions, that's, that's the problem. So you're a convicted felon, you're only a member at this time, but then suddenly you become the controlling member, that trigger, that will trigger the code prohibition because of that felony. Well, I, I, and so I understand that. I think we can get the same place. We get this confusion because the license or is it the business, <coughs> and we say you don't have a business unless you have a license. But then if you're an owner... Well, that's, not, that's also not entirely true because you can have a license but no business yet. There are two distinct items. The business, generically speaking, should be thought of as like the asset, the asset of the license, which is maybe it's the product you've already purchased, maybe it's the storefront you've already rented, maybe it's the ads you've already taken out. Everything that goes into operating a business is an asset of that business. The right to have that asset, operate that asset, own that asset, comes through the license. So I think the, the thing that makes it weird with the marijuana establishments is they have to have the location and the rental agreement or the right. purchase first. So in typical businesses, yeah, you would get your license to operate and then work off of that, but the fact that these are tight, like you have to have your location, 
set in order to even apply for the license, I think it kind of flips that, at least in my mind, like for, for the startup for the startup phase. Right. Yeah. I mean it's tied to that location. So I don't know. Like that's that's what has made it kind of Right. It's a it's a non it's a non geographically transferable right. business. Right. Right. <laughs> it's a place. So Janet, do you have recommendations or only troubles? I you know, <laughs> um I I I don't I mean I, the only recommendation I can make is maybe we can make this like instead of saying you know, don't use a dollar when a penny will do. You know, maybe we can make this language like just simpler as to like what we actually need, and then start from there. Because yeah. I feel like we kind of went backwards, <clears throat> went backwards into this, and it's kind of like we're trying to make it fit into like a square when it's really like a rectangle. And I, I'm just having a really hard time. Maybe I'm just like maybe this is just past my pay grade, but I'm having a hard time. Can you, Janet, give us a describe the scenario you're trying to solve with this problem? So I'm trying to. Split. What I was trying to do is, you know, take an example. I had a, you know, RC tuner box. They wanted to bring um, somebody in to do extractions, and they wanted to transfer their extractions license to that person in the same facility, in the same spot. Um, and that we couldn't do that, right? We couldn't do that because that would be prohibited. And so, um, trying to figure out when, when an LLC owns two licenses or two different lines of businesses. So, you know, maybe that was. You know, maybe there could be a way to transfer this license from the business to a separate business. There, so let me pause right there. So mm -hmm. you can transfer the business. You cannot transfer the license. Yeah, and that's so our, right. any, any extraction, inventory, asset, space that they have for the extraction license can be bought, sold, transferred, etc. Their license, their right to operate the, the extraction mm -hmm. cannot. The new, the potential purchaser would need to acquire a new license. Mm -hmm. And I think the question, question right? And I think the question that arose from that for us was: so if the same LLC owns three licenses, and they're wanting just one of those licenses to be operated or owned by somebody else. They can't do that because the LLC. It would have to be transfer of all three licenses that are owned by the LLC. Uh, I think what they what would happen, if I remember according to code, is technically the RC extraction license would no longer be operating because they no longer have that business. They have sold potentially sold a business. They're required to turn that license in, so the extraction license should just go away. And so a new business could get the state license transferred to them, but apply for a new muni. They'll license. have to apply for a new muni license, and then they and then RC and the potential purchaser can work out the terms of buying the assets of the extraction operation. But the the municipal license itself is non-transferable. Chris, any thoughts? Where's your solution? <laughs> um, only that this seems pretty complex, and I would welcome Janet to write us a brief on what she would like. And uh, I have to actually run right now to get prepared for our 11 o'clock uh, rules committee meeting. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. I can take us out of me trying to simplify this a little well, bit. Yeah. And that's kind of what we did in this packet, too, yeah. is there's a few different options of trying to clarify the code as is or change it to where um, transfer of the license is allowed to be in line with the state. So there's a couple of different options for discussion. Um, and then, you know, yeah, the it would help clarify it. Yeah, I, I like the third line where you guys did. I thought that was helpful. That's it. I think, I think what would be most helpful um, for, for this project is uh, giving some direction from the county. If we want to try to make it like the states and allow the license itself to be transferable or uh, retain, I guess, or to say licenses are more transferable, call out the language and that be gone. So I guess that would be useful. You know, I, I, I think the 
I don't see a mechanism for a secondary value market for these licenses. But a big concern is we do want to have complete control over the license so we can take it away and shut the operation down. So that's the critical factor, so whatever we do. Um, Mandy? So one other thing with um, the state license application transfer, it's very similar to their new application. Anybody that would be a new owner has to go through the same vetting. Um, they have to do the background check, so we get that same information. So if we did align ourselves with the state, it would basically be like a new application, even though we call it a transfer of the license. We would still get all of the same information on the application, and we would still have our application process that they would have to apply for the transfer of the license with us, and we would get the same checking of taxes, fees, or fines, and whatever for all of the individuals. So that was kind of part of this too, is, is, it, is it something that we are making the industry do things in a roundabout, hard to track way, or make it so that it's available for them to do up front, and we can track it and maybe have a better idea of what's going on with it was kind of our discussion. I would agree with that because I mean the way this is it, it's like how Dean was saying a bunch of shell games and creating different things to type and it's like it there's a lot easy like there's a lot a lot of ways to hide things that way and do things and then Manny's way is way more transparent. Well the, the way it's set up now is you can't you can't transfer a license at all. I mean, you can transfer everything that's not the license through normal channels. And so that's the, that's the big change here is we're saying, well, wait, it actually makes sense to allow license transfers to occur provided they go through the same application process. So that, I mean, that's really the, the binary choice you're, you're asking yourself now is do we want to stick with not allowing transfers or of the license or do we want to allow license transfers? And that would make it easy, as Mandy indicated, uh, codifying a format for doing license transfers will help on the business side because it's a little easier to understand than, than selling assets and applying for a new license. But essentially, we're doing the same thing. We're just calling it a license transfer now. There, but there's also confusion. I mean, we can say what an LLC owns it, even though that ownership of the LLC could change completely, which in reality is a transfer of a license in the normal person's thinking. But we also see in these applications, people say, oh, I'm the licensee. I mean, personally, even if I'm an LLC, yeah. you know, if their concept going through it is there to the licensee. So they're confused. We should make it so the people running these businesses should not be confused about their status yeah. in the business. The LLCs are a much different beast, no matter if you're talking about li liquor licenses, marijuana licenses, or owning, owning buildings. Um, and they have a whole separate set of rules, but the entity itself, the LLC, the license is tied to that LLC and the membership changes provided it doesn't change the the control controlling well, interest, it doesn't really change, matter. It can change the controlling interest of the LLC. That's just when it triggers the application for a controlling interest and that goes before the assembly. But right. I mean, that's kind of where we were coming from. It essentially is the transfer of the license because that controlling interest could go to a completely different individual, a natural person, but they're buying the controlling interest of the LLC that holds the license. Right. So it is essentially and trigger a transfer the new. of the license yeah. ownership. But, but, it's but just the new individual, the new buyer, would have to pass all the background right. checks. Which right. they would have to do if we allowed transfer of the license along with the business. Right. It does make it easier, though. Yeah. So we can make this easier. Yeah. You can. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. That would be cool. Progress. Uh, do you have a question? Um, even, I mean, when we talk about transferring controlling interest or just reporting less than controlling interest at transfer, the report still requires all the application information, you know, so it's not like uh, transferring 25% is going to get around everything. It just doesn't go to the same report either, but it has to include that Correct. check and all the information. Anyways, I mean, um, the new rule, you know, I guess the assembly will see the new applications, so things have changed to get down the packet, you know, for this, except for new and new answers. So I think we're going to slip through the cracks, I think. That's a really interesting point, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, unlike alcohol, obviously, we see these over and over and over, so it is, 
I, 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 I favor trying to make it as simple as possible. I think we have plenty of control over these things. Uh, I think we just need to clarify and simplify and allow it. And I don't think, given the realities of business and how tied we are, that we're going to see something like what happened in the tax permit. This yeah. is not realistic. Okay, so where are we? We want guidance for Dean. Deanna might look at something if you can. I, I can, but I, I would urge kind of, you know, following maybe how the state is doing it and kind of creating that simplicity, you know, overall. Because you have, you know, over half the market here in this town. Um, so you might want to think about how to actually flow better, just kind of following the state method. Create some sort of standing operating procedure for transfer. Right, yeah, just, yeah. So, so that's almost where you went. We can transfer them to say how to do it. Oh, I mean, I'm curious, Janet, if you have clients in their jurisdictions in yeah. So for the most part, of, and I won't speak to the whole other part of the state, but for the most part, there isn't a specialized local process for the transfers. They just follow what the state does, and they get reports from the state, and they um, kind of rely on how the state handles the transfers. So Cambridge is kind of a different beast because you have to kind of really look at what, what and looking at, you know, this was this was tough, you know, for me, and I being helped me out with a a transfer where you know there was 50 percent new owners coming in and then an llc with the original owner one original owner but the other half was gone and he helped me kind of you know work through that um but i mean you guys don't want to deal with me all the time so i think you make it simpler <laughs> okay so maybe make it simpler and then Dean, if you could look and say how can we make it more parallel to states but without any Certainly about the fact that we can pull those licenses. We, can the state pull the license? Absolutely. Yeah, so, okay, have so, license. Okay, so we don't want to. We want to have the ability to shut down the operation by pulling the license. Okay. Okay. Good. We have that done. And you expecting that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have a meeting on um, this two weeks that, that we'll look at. We're going to be talking about alcohol rules. I won't be here, and I'd like to be involved with this. But then another one is really June. We do one. We have one before the first assembly meeting in June. Like we could. Do we have any licenses? Out? I haven't received anything. I have going forward. Sure. 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 Yeah. 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 yeah, at this point, there's no new licenses. First meeting in June, correct? Yeah. Right. Well, we might do the accessory dwelling. For the public hearing? Have a, we might I have a meeting. Look at the sounds like we will have a meeting on Christmas accessory dwelling. That could be early June. This could be in May. And are you familiar with the Bay Area Council? Yeah, I'm not in crisis. Okay. Yeah, I'm not in crisis. 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 I'm not in cris
Someone oh, you mentioned the word franchise to today, and it got me to think. Are we? Are, is our code set up for someone say that we had an operator that was doing such a great job that he was cornering the market, so to speak? Say, I'm saying, I'm saying, Labs has got the best reputation. Everybody wants to buy their stuff or whatever, and so that name becomes McDonald's for marijuana or whatever. And so uh, how would you go about franchising other locations? Well, we trademarked it um, in the state of Alaska. And uh, he could lease or license his name for value from monetary value to another company if he wanted to. And then likely we would have to give that agreement to Anjo. Um, to Harriet Milks, who's good, she's an attorney for, for the board, um, to make sure in her interpretation it didn't violate the direct and indirect financial interests, you know, because if it was based off of a percentage of sales or whatnot, they might, you know, they might find that to be a probative interest. Well, I mean, so the other, obviously, there, if, if they were going to be using the Einstein lab name, there would have to be uh, some monetary uh, money changing hands, obviously. Uh, but if, um, you know, more or less it would just more or less be a name change because the location would stay the same. The product would, they'd be probably using Einstein, Einstein product exclusively. Yeah. But, uh, but, but we have no restrictions in our code on where, whose product they buy. So. You don't. We would have to file, if it was, you know, say Einstein, say Uncle Irv was going to take on Einstein's things and there was a licensing agreement, Uncle Irv would have to file an MJ-13 to change the name of the state of Alaska and get a new business license. So um, say Uncle Irv's real business entity is LHS Management, that would have to purchase a business license under Einstein's 2 or Einstein on wherever, you know, whatever, whatever state they're in. Um, um, I think that it's now kind of difficult, like Jan said, to have an arrangement. Each location has to have a license anymore, but you can have the world LLC doing business as franchising. Right. So in each different location, doing business as the franchising. Anyway, somebody mentioned the name franchising and since I used to be in the restaurant business, it got my mind. Mm -hmm. And did you have some of those in Colorado? I, I've heard that. that I heard the California is happening yeah. that too. And you'll see there's licensing agreements happening up here too. Um, but we just have to submit those licensing agreements to the state of Alaska control board so that they can review it to make sure because it's not defined the prohibitions indirect or indirect. Direct or indirect um, isn't really defined, so they make that decision, you know, behind closed doors. Anything else?